you may be thinking, what right does a non-scientist, albeit a former political advisor to prime ministers, have to talk to us about the science of climate change? Well, I have as much right as Al Gore has. Um, he's no scientist, yet, like me, he made a movie about global warming, and it won an Oscar for Best Sci-Fi Comedy Horror. <laughs> I'm going to show you an enormous amount of information, real information overload, from the scientific journals, which will give you a different perspective on climate change, I, because I don't want you simply to go on believing, if any of you do, in this new religion of climate change. Now, the first chairman of this intergovernmental panel on climate change was Sir John Horton. And he said, unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. None of the studies cited above has shown clear evidence that we can attribute observed climate changes to the specific cause of increases in greenhouse gases. No study to date has positively attributed all or part of the climate change observed to date to anthropogenic causes. Any claims of positive detection of significant climate change are likely to remain controversial until uncertainties in the total natural variability of the climate system are reduced. All three of the quotations I've just given you, which were in the draft approved by the scientists, were taken out by the politicians and bureaucrats, and the following was substituted. The balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global now, these episodes, and many others like them, which I could have quoted, raised in my mind, when I was first researching this, the possibility that the IPCC is indeed politically motivated to state a particular case regardless of the scientific truth. And I therefore began examining its documents myself. And I came across, in the 2007 report of which I got the final draft, which was reviewed by the scientists, um, an error so as to magnify tenfold the influence of climate change, supposed, on the melting of the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. Here they are here. Now you can see, if you add up these numbers here, they do not come to the IPCC's total. Why? Because the decimal points here that should be over here are... Uh, they've just multiplied all these numbers by 10. These four red numbers, they've all been multiplied by 10 when they shouldn't have been. So we're told there's a scientific consensus and Al Gore even tries to tell us that that consensus is unanimous. So do the learned papers of scientists in climate and related fields uniformly predict the catastrophes uniformly predicted by the BBC and other media which have taken formal in BBC's case or informal decisions to abandon any semblance of objectivity? No. A survey of 539 papers containing the words global climate change and published between 2004 and mid-February 2007 found that only one of the papers even mentioned the possibility that global warming might be catastrophic and even that paper offered no evidence whatsoever in support of the imagined catastrophe. Here is a thing showing the medieval warm period, and it was labelled by the IPCC as medieval warm period. It's very plainly visible there. Here is the Little Ice Age during the Maunder Minimum, when there were no sunspots on the sun for about 60 years, and the temperatures went down. And here is the, the current period. Um, eventually it's going to go up a bit, but it's still a long way below what was shown in the IPCC's 1990 graph. In 2001, this graph appeared... No medieval warm period. Just like that, as Tommy Cooper might say. It vanished, it disappeared. And so we get this, what they call the hockey stick graph. It runs along all the way like this, and then, wee, it goes up here, as though this is somehow exceptional. Now, the UN, the IPCC, they were really pleased with this graph. They printed it six times, large and in full colour, in their 2001 report, the only graph to appear six times, the only graph to appear in full colour six times.
the question then arises, uh, how did they achieve this remarkable result in just 11 years to wipe out all the historical records, all the enormous number of papers in the scientific literature testing in one way or another to the existence of a medieval warm period all around the world? How did they do it? Here's one of the things they did. They took um, a particular type of data, a particular data set, and here it is from Sheep Mountain, California. And this particular data set has a very satisfactory, from their point of view, hockey stick shape. Whoosh, up it goes at the end there. The blade of the hockey stick and the shank along there. But this one from Maybury Slough in Arizona doesn't have that. It has a sort of peak in 1800, but then otherwise it's more or less jogging along all in a straight line. So what did they do? They gave this data... 390 times as much weighting in their computer program as they gave this data, because this data gave them the shape they wanted to have. It's an extraordinary thing. They then went on and left out the tree ring data set that included the medieval warm period. Because if you put it back in, then it showed that the medieval warm period was actually there. They said they'd included the data set they'd left out. They published a paper in Nature, 1998, and again in 1999. They said they'd included that data set, but they hadn't. They'd actually left it out. They'd hidden the missing data in a file which was marked on their own computer, where it was later found by two diligent researchers from Canada. They'd hidden it in a file marked Censored Data. That's what they'd done with it, Censored Data. It's better to have a warmer climate. Why do most species in the world live in the tropics, because it's warmer there. Why do practically no species live in the Arctic and the Antarctic? Because it freezes your nuts off and it makes reproduction difficult. At the moment, the polar ice caps of Mars are melting. There has been warming noticed on the surface of Jupiter, on one of the moons of Neptune, even on far distant Pluto, all at the same time. And why is this? Because astronauts are taking their 4 by 4s up into space? No. It's because the sun, as we'll see, has been remarkably active. Now, Herschel, the astronomer, in 1801, noticed that when there were more sunspots and therefore more solar activity, grain prices went down because everybody was growing more grain. And this was in an 11-year cycle these sunspots tended to go. And even in that 11-year cycle, you could detect the changes in the grain prices because even in the relatively small changes between the maximum and minimum of a solar cycle, that was enough to influence the way the grain grew and Herschel spotted it. Now... Let's go to this very interesting paper by Sami Solanke. He's, he's one of the most expert solar physicists. He's very balanced. He doesn't take either side in this debate. What he says is the level of solar activity during the past 70 years is exceptional and the previous period of equally high activity occurred more than 8,000 years ago. We find that during the past 11,400 years, the sun has spent only of the order of 10% of the time at a similarly high level of magnetic activity and almost all of the earlier high activity periods were shorter than the present episode. Temperature doesn't track CO2 well, we've seen that, but it does track solar activity rather well. These, this is not my conclusion, this is a conclusion of the International Astronomical Union Symposium in 2004. This is what they said, this is not me talking here. Solar changes cause most climate change. Solar cycles are 11, 80 and 200 years long. We've seen the 11 year cycle very clearly in the charts we've seen. The sun caused today's warming. Today's warming is normal, not unusual. Today's warming will end soon. Here is a formidable atmospheric physicist from Japan, Sunichi Akasofu. No supercomputer, no matter how powerful, is able to prove definitively a simplistic hypothesis that says the greenhouse effect is responsible for warming. It can't be done. Mm -hmm.